timing, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Hugh. Thank you, Nikki. So, so um, welcome, everybody. I, I'm just going to ask you to forget some of what Nikki said, uh, because um, otherwise I'm going to have to remember what not to say later on. Um, so, so just please blank all that stuff, apart from the bits about uh, my books. That's nice. That's very nice. Um, I'm just going to uh, whiz on to um, my screen. And here we go. Hopefully everything's going. So actually, I changed the title because you know what? I was getting um, um, fed up. I need to start with a joke. Uh, why did the hedgehog cross the road? And it's not as uh, uh, more traditionally may thought uh, to see his flatmate or, or to show he had guts, but it's because the reason the hedgehog crossed the road is, is quite simply because our planning system is so inept that the hedgehog was obliged to cross the road because there weren't enough hedgehog highways between the gardens. Uh, so this is not a question uh, of humor. It's a question of planning. Uh, which is, I think, the antithesis of humour, if my memory serves me correct. So um, this is, uh, yeah, my life has been spent a lot involved with hedgehogs. It really has. I started studying hedgehogs in 1986. Um, this photograph was sent to me quite recently by my um, supervisor at that time in the early 90s, uh, Dr. Pat Morris. And I was doing some radio uh, uh, tracking work for him. Uh, down in Devon. And uh, the reason that this photograph amused me was because um, my wife had just taken, oops, my wife had just taken this photograph of me and um, and it was just basically how little has changed. Um, I mean, there's, there's a main difference is, as you can tell, I'm now wearing gloves because uh, we have become more aware of, of the potential transmission of zoonoses from hedgehogs to people. Um, and it's something which, uh, Actually, when you get used to handling hedgehogs, it sort of, you forget about it. Um, though there is a warn word of caution, actually. I met a hedgehog rescuer once, and she was telling me the story of uh, how she'd ended up going to the doctor because she'd got a, uh, a strange uh, patch on her skin, um, on her nose. And, um, and it was, she was concerned it was skin cancer. Um, and so she went to the doctors, and the doctor just looked at her and was absolutely dumbfounded. And he just said, you know, I've never met somebody with ringworm on their nose. How on earth? How on earth could you get ringworm on your nose? It's a contact transmission. And um, they said, have you had any close contact with any animals which might have involved your nose? And um, and she had to admit that, that she had been kissing all her hedgehogs goodnight. Um, anyway, point being is you can catch diseases from hedgehogs, uh, um, in particular if, if you go smooching, so, so don't do that. Uh, but they are gorgeous, they are wonderful, and, um, and I hope that the reason you are here is that you all generally agree about this. Um, so as Nikki kindly pointed out, I have been writing books. Um, my first book was a bit of an accident, I wasn't planning on writing a book, um, but I got sort of talked into it, and um, A Prickly Affair uh, remains the only book ever to be published, which have got endorsements on the cover from both Jeanette Winterson, um, arguably one of our greatest living writers, and um, Anne Widdicombe. Uh, I, I think there's some suggestion this is the only thing they have ever agreed upon ever, uh, which, which shows the true power of the hedgehog. I wrote a book about the iconography of hedgehogs because basically that was all the material I wrote in the first book, which then my editor told me to take out. And then more recently, a little book about hedgehogs for a wonderful publisher called Graphegg. And I'm just looking around me to see, oh, I've lost it. Um, I've, I've just written a book about beavers for them, just finished writing a book about water voles. Um, and they're just a really sweet little thing. Oh, sorry, if we were doing this in person, I would be in a lecture theater now and there would be a stack of books in front of me acting as a perpetual prompt um, subliminally, uh, um, making you feel an urge to buy books. And then you'd come along at the end and get them signed. And I'm really sorry, we're not gonna be able to do that. However, if you were so minded as to want to buy a book, um, you can send me a stamp stressed envelope and I will send you uh, uh, little book plates to stick into your books uh, just because, um, because I got, I got to eat. Anyway, uh, moving on. One of my jobs is as a spokesperson for the British Hedgehog Preservation Society. Um, and it's, it's, it sounds very grand, but mostly it's, there's not a lot going on, but then suddenly there's a flurry of interest and, um, and, I, get, and I get very busy. The Hedgehog Society was set up in 1982 uh, by uh, uh, Major Adrian Coles and um, he'd finished um, soldiering and had moved to Shropshire and uh, was really concerned to find um, hedgehogs dead in cattle grids. 
And uh, so he started a campaign um, just encouraging people to put bricks in cattle grids to allow hedgehogs to climb out of them. And this then grew into a, a change in the design of, of cattle grids and as a British standard ramp, which should be included. Um, but it was just one of those small little moments which really captured people's attention and made him realize that there was uh, um, uh, space for a uh, space for society dedicated uh, to, to the, the care and conservation of hedgehogs. Um, and so I've, so yes, it has been over 35 years now since I started studying hedgehogs. And most of the people who I was, um, sort of started out at Leicester Polytechnic back in the uh, mid 1980s. And yeah, most people who stayed in this sort of world, you know, they, they begin with, you know, studying, I don't know, mice, and then maybe move on to badgers before eventually sort of moving on to elephants or something. It was a gradual sort of transition over time. And I started um, with hedgehogs. And um, I did have a brief flirtation in the um, early 1990s uh, with pangolins. Um, I, I spent, uh, spent a year uh, involved with pangolins. Uh, you will, those of you uh, alert to these things, will notice that that is yet another largely insectivorous animal um, that, uh, that curls up in a ball when frightened. Um, so th th there are some parallels, but um, obviously it was nice to go to Namibia. Anyway, so why spend so much time with this actually quite mundane species. And the reason is, well, the reason's subtle. Um, I was at a gardening um, club in Oxfordshire last night. And the week before I was at a university of the third age. And the week before that I was at a women's institute. And each of these groups invites me in to talk about hedgehogs, which is fantastic. Uh, but they wouldn't invite me in to talk about, I don't know, the necessity of dismantling industrial capitalism, the transport infrastructure, the, the way that we grow our food, about the, the, the planning system, all of these things um, would, wouldn't be very attractive for uh, a sort of generalist audience. Um, so I use the hedgehog, well, I basically I've got a Trojan hedgehog. I use the hedgehog to get into places I wouldn't normally be able to, and then have a conversation about things which I think are really important. So for me, the hedgehog is a particularly valuable species. Uh, in that it allows me to talk to a very wide range of people um, who I wouldn't necessarily get to meet. Um, and you know, most recently, actually, I've got, this is, I'm in my shed at the moment, and it's just that moment. I did warn uh, Nikki that, that I'm gradually going to take clothes off, but it's only, I think, as far as a tweed jacket by the end. Um, so this is a moment of excitement because for the last two years, I've been doing talks with State of Britain's Hedgehogs 2018 um, uh, uh, at this sort of juncture. And I've been frustrated because, I mean, it's, it's been difficult. The, the, the wonderful team um, at the People's Trust uh, as well have been, have been working to pull together the report. These reports are vital. Um, what we do is we have a whole bunch, well, there's five different surveys, which are long running surveys. And most of them have been running since the year 2000. And so what we are able to do with the replication of the surveys in the same way over time is begin to get a picture of population change. Now, it does, there's no good answer to the how many hedgehogs are that question. Um, it's all a bit of a guess. But what we do know with a degree of robustness is how the population has changed over time. And that's something which is uh, important because it gives us a real guide to what's going on. And so what we know now is that from the year 2000 to you know, this, this report coming out, so the data is up until 2021, urban populations of hedgehogs have dropped by around a third, oh, about 30% um, over that time. But there is some evidence now that in the last two surveys, the population has leveled off and there may even be a slight uptick. And this is very exciting. We, we, we're not quite at the point of marching bands and bunting, but we are, excited by it because most of the effort that we've put in so far has been directed at the sort of suburban hedgehog populations. And that, that's not um, out of any sort of, uh, well, um, the bias is quite straightforward. Um, the big issues which we need to address in our rural landscape are enormous. Um, and uh, yeah, to do with the way we grow our food and the way we develop a transport infrastructure. Um, and for any individual to be able to take action in those areas is very difficult. But we've got 
many of us have got uh, a patch of land that we have some degree of agency over our gardens. And that gives us an opportunity of being able to talk to people about something they themselves can do. And we are very pleased that you know, many, many thousands of people have been doing it. The problem in our rural landscape is rather more dramatic. And um, since the year 2000, there has been a decline between 30% and 75% nationally, depending on which part of the country. And where the largest declines are being seen at the moment um, in, in the sort of eastern half of the country uh, is, is where, I mean, that it feels a bit like we're playing a sort of catch up game, um, sort of leveling off to the bottom, leveling down. Um, still, bigger picture from that, the Mammal Society did a report which suggested there'd been a two thirds decline in hedgehogs nationally since the uh, mid 1990s. Um, so that was less robust than our data. The data which I'm now going to present to you is actually what's traditionally known as anec data, anecdotal data, and it's come from uh, um, a, a very unsystematic review of hundreds and hundreds of talks I've given to people around the country. And um, this is then mainly, and this has been quite an interesting process for me, mainly at a much more mature audience. Um, so the WI, so the Towns Women's Guild, the University of the Third Age, Probus Business Lunches, Gardening Clubs. Though the one I was at last night, I was saying, of course, it's um, yeah, been really interesting talking to an audience who are much older than me and then realizing that I am gradually catching them up. But it has been useful because over time, um, I, you know, I've, 10 years ago, talking to people in their 80s about what they used to see in their gardens. And it's not robust, but there has been enough enough uh, uh, similarity for me to make a very big guesstimate that since the end of the Second World War, arguably populations of hedgehogs are down between 90 and 95 percent. That is guesstimates territory, but it's enormous. And remember, this is the nation's favorite creature. That's the thing which really strikes me about this. We pay a lot of attention to hedgehogs. We worry about hedgehogs. So what does this tell us about all of the other species out there which people really don't care so much about? That's the reason why we really need to be alarmed about these figures. This is a generalist species with the capacity of being able to live in a wide range of different habitats. There are hedgehogs of the same species that we have living in Norway and, they're, 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 and in Spain. Um, you know, they can cope with a wide variety of different environments, yet we are seeing this catastrophic decline. Um, just as an aside on the side of this, I, I'm just putting it out there that maybe anybody has a direct line into Elon Musk, uh, because I don't understand. Uh, um, we had, uh, when we released the report last, last week, I think it was, we had a big flurry of press and um, with out of nowhere, Elon Musk responded, uh, I'm suggesting, suggesting basically that we're all warlocks. And I, I mean, there may be some messaging in there, which I simply don't understand, because obviously I'm not quite as clever as he is. Uh, but if somebody could explain in the chat, I, I'm basically I'm happy if he'll help fund my research to do all of my talks dressed up as a warlock. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I will do whatever it takes. So um, I'm talking about sort of the robustness, and that's why my figure of 90 to 95% is, you know, park it to one side, it's not robust. Um, when we have figures, uh, stories like this appearing in the press, this was Michaela Strachan after our 2015 report came out. Um, she basically looked at the graph of the population decline over time, drew a straight line, it hit zero in 10 years, which is 2025, and, um, and she, she wrote a piece in the Radio Times. Now, when this sort of thing happens, my role as a spokesperson for the Hedgehog Society comes into its own and my phone starts ringing an awful lot. And, um, and so I had presumed that this was simply a case of her being misquoted, um, that she'd been talking about a, a, um, a localized extinctions, that sort of thing. And so I did a degree of beration of the various journalists who phoned me up saying, you know, is this true? Are hedgehogs going to be extinct in 10 years? Because it's vitally important that the conservation messaging that we put out is based on the best science we've got. There's absolutely no benefit to be had from, from uh, um, uh, hyperbole. There's just no benefit at all. And so I did that repeatedly. And the last journalist who phoned me was from The Independent. And I just, a shout out to that missed, much missed paper, um, for having a journalist who's willing to quote you absolutely precisely. Now I am happy to offer 
media training to people, and I, I do do this, and um, one of the first things I'll say is always think before you speak, but in my defense, it has been quite a long day. So we need to base our messaging on the science. So we know about our rural hedgehog population that they've got a number of very key pressures. So this uh, a field of oilseed rape growing in Cambridgeshire. Um, the latest work from Professor Dave Goulson, um, he of the wonderful books about bumblebees and solitary bees, um, he did an analysis of the number of biocides applied to each crop of industrialized uh, industrial crop. And um, this was an average of 17 different biocides applications per crop. So this isn't 17 different trips out, the things are mixed up in tanks beforehand. Um, and the bio, by biocide, that's a word which was coined by um, Rachel Carson and in her fantastic, uh, really, really fantastic book, Silent Spring, which I read for the first time only quite recently. Um, I'd read extracts when I was doing my degree, but hadn't quite realized how special that book is. Um, so the idea of a biocide, so this is the fungicides, the molluscicides, um, um, herbicides, insecticides, all of these different agrochemicals which are applied to the fields, uh, they are there with the specific aim of removing competition. I mean, this is, this is not a farmer bashing thing, it's a reality thing. The farmer needs to make a profit and to make a profit, the farmer needs to remove competition. It's just unfortunate that competition is also hedgehog food and toad food, bat food, garden, uh, 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 farmland bird food. I mean, if you, if you look at the uh, uh, progress of farmland birds over time, the British Trust for Ornithology's data is very clear and it shows a very similar path to that of hedgehogs. Uh, we are removing the food from the landscape. The, the, there's the terrifying uh, research, I think it's published in 2017 or 2018 from Germany where they had um, looked at, uh, they used a malaise trap. So it's a trap which does exactly, it just sits there collecting flying insects. Uh, so there's no issue about uh, um, the effort employed in the process. And the malaise trap uh, it showed that over 27 years, uh, the biomass of flying insects had declined by 75%. And this, this paper was, was scary for well, many reasons, but two in particular. One is that this is, this is biomass. Normally people just look at biodiversity. Um, and, and they would then, and, but if in this instance had looked at the biodiversity, they would have found very little change over those 27 years. The insect species were still there. There was just 75% less mass. And that's 75% less food for the hedgehogs, the toads, the bats, the birds. And the other part of it was that this was undertaken in protected areas, in the areas which, all, which, which, which had some degree of protection. Um, so it's that loss of insect life macroinvertebrate life, which is so absolutely at the heart of what's going on here. And, and, and you know, come the summer, if we're fortunate enough to have one of those, um, summer's evening drives, just for those of you who remember the 1970s on a summer's evening drive and remember the insects splashed on the windscreen on the, on the headlights and, and you look at the cars now, they're, they're pretty clean. And a little bit of that is down to improved aerodynamics, but there are so many, you know, the projects ongoing with pieces of vertical card on the fronts of cars uh, catching insects. You know, the insect life isn't there. So big fields covered in insecticides, et cetera, remove hedgehog food. And the big fields, well, you've got to consider the name of the animal, the hedge hog, they hog the hedges, they're an edge specialist, and it becomes difficult for a hedgehog to move through the landscape as well. There's no inducement to go into this field because there's no food and to walk around, they will walk around the edge of the field until they can find a linear feature to follow to get across the field. And they are often not there. So it's, that is a big part of our problem. It's very difficult to have a conversation about the state of rural hedgehogs without mentioning badgers. And this is where um, I find myself um, often uh, um, well, losing some friends. Uh, when I was doing a um, talk at the a Badger Trust conference a while ago, uh, the um, director at the time, Dominic Dyer, was introducing me, uh, walking me up onto the stage. And in a stage whisper, he sort of said to me, I, I, I've left the, um, the, the, the emergency exit ajar so you can get out quicker, because he knew I was about to do something which was going to cause trouble. Now, I've, in my time studying hedgehogs, I've actually had the misfortune of even seeing one of my studied hedgehogs being eaten by a badger. Badgers do eat hedgehogs. But you've got to consider with badgers that there are two different sorts of people when it comes to them. 
um, that you've got one group of people who consider the badger in the pantheon of all that is good. The badger is up there uh, uh, with, with, with Marcus Rashford and Lady Di and, um, and Zelensky in, in, in Ukraine. I mean, you, you, cannot, you cannot say anything against the badger. And then there are people who know with equal amounts of certainty that the four horsemen of the apocalypse had a pet badger and the badgers are responsible uh, uh, for, for, for Brexit, Covid, uh, Boris Johnson and Putin. Um, so and, and the thing which is then I have to apologise for is it's not a black and white issue. OK, I'm here all night, um, available for stand up comedy gigs later. So there, they are. It's not a black and white issue. It's complex. It's ecology. If 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 you want to study something simple, do astrophysics, because ecology is eternally complicated. And what we have here is um, these two species have an asymmetric intraguild predatory relationship that they are principally operating within the same ecological guild. They eat the same food. They're competitors for macroinvertebrates. If you look at um, um, fecal analysis or stomach content analysis across the year, the, the item of food, which is constant pretty much in their diets, are, are earthworms. They, they, they compete for earthworms, but all the other macroinvertebrates too. But badgers have a number of distinct advantages. Badgers are simply better at hunting earthworms than hedgehogs are because uh, badgers can dig, hedgehogs just scratch the surface. So when the weather gets slightly drier and, and the, in, the, the invertebrates disappear, Badgers can dig down. Badgers also have an advantage in that they're much more omnivorous and they can fatten up on the peanuts scattered around this, this set in, North, in, in mid Wales um, or on the maize which farmers plant um, to get the, the biofuel subsidies when they were being offered uh, quite generously. Um, so they will be benefit from that. So they have those advantages. They also disadvantage hedgehogs not only by potential predation, though the predation seems to be a facet of the wider ecological trouble. Um, our best understanding, and I should say this is a case of best understanding because things change. Um, our best understanding is that normally badgers and hedgehogs can coexist. I mean, they have coexisted on, the, um, uh, on this sort of patch of earth uh, for the last 10,000 years, and they were here in the previous interglacial too. We know that these two species can live together. But our best understanding is that when the wider system becomes degraded, their relationship shifts from being one of competition to one of predation. So we have this, it's, and it's an importantly subtle uh, thing to consider. It's erroneous to leap in now um, and call for killing badgers to save hedgehogs. Uh, there are some um, hoary handed men of the soil um, like Robin Page and co who are, uh, who know, um, um, far more than lily livered and soft handed people like myself ever can do uh, about how things are in the countryside. And they know that the only true way to solve most problems is to kill badgers. Um, that is not an ecologically literate way forward. What we need to do is look at the wider environment, look at the problems that are there and try and resolve those so that both species have got the capacity to coexist. But it's also important to recognize that there is an issue. When you get an increased number of badgers, you do get a decreased number of hedgehogs. Now, if you look at the decline of hedgehogs across the country, those most dramatic declines are taking place in areas with no or very few badgers. So, you know, these big population declines are being driven by other things. Badgers are just part of the mix, as are motor cars. I mean, the most stereotypical view of the hedgehog certainly used to be being squashed on the roads. Now, I've had many a time at a, at, a, at a talk where people said, well, isn't it great? You know, we're seeing fewer hedgehogs squashed on the roads. And I go, no, 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 this is really, really bad. Because one of the most valuable tools we've got uh, in the surveys that are undertaken is the, the People's Trust for Endangered Species Survey uh, and Mammals on Roads, which it's gruesome. It does what it says on the tin. Um, people record the numbers of dead mammals they see and where they see them on specific journeys at specific times of the year. And it's, it's, it's not a random free for all, but it's a very specific piece of science. And we know that hedgehogs have not got any cleverer when it comes to crossing roads. The reason you're seeing fewer hedgehogs squashed on the roads is because there are fewer hedgehogs there trying to cross the roads. Uh, there are a few circumstances like motorways where hedgehogs don't even bother trying to cross the roads. Uh, that's radio tracking studies have shown that. But we have an added problem is, I mean, this is the ring road around um, around Oxford. And there was a horrible car crash there about 15 years ago. 
And so they installed the concrete barrier. And these concrete barriers are going up um, all over the country. Um, this meant that, I mean, this road at two o'clock in the morning, it was quite quiet. And that hedgehogs would have been able to cross that. I mean, a bit of a risk, but they'd have been able to do it. Now it's impossible. That's two or three miles long. So we are creating fragmentation in the landscape. Oh, I forgot to add the fragmentation effect that badgers give us, give hedgehogs. Um, the, the, the sort of landscape of fear that, that badgers create. Uh, when a hedgehog leaves a village um, and moves out across the countryside, if it comes across an active badger set or latrine along the hedge line that it's walking along, for example, it will stop and come back again. And so we end up fragmenting the landscape as, as, as one does with, with roads. We think probably 80,000 hedgehogs roughly are killed on the roads each year. It's hard to get a pinpoint the figure, but it's, it's in that sort of order. It's a conservation level threat. Now, the fragmentation can take place in all sorts of different forms. This is 50 metres that way. Um, and it's the, the canalised boundary brook at the bottom of my road. And um, it was canalised in 1970s, I think, in an attempt to stop flooding where we are, uh, which probably would have been effective if Thames Water had actually uh, done what they said they were going to do and kept the drains clean. But that's another story. Um, but this is also a pitfall trap an extremely effective pitfall trap. This is the, I've, I've rescued four hedgehogs now from here. Once they're in here, they are simply going to die. There is no way out. Um, and at the top of the picture, you can see a small footpath that is uh, known by all the kids who go to the school at the end of it as Pooh Path. It's a very dogged area. Um, yeah, hedgehogs will probably try to cross through the garden just uh, um, in front of the hedgehog's nose, fall into this, and then they will be stuck there. Um, we chop the landscape up in all sorts of different ways. And, and this is proving to be more and more, well, our understanding is how important it's becoming. And it, it's grown on the back of research, which has been done over many years. Nigel Reeve, an old friend and, and colleague of mine, did this work in a, on a Surrey golf course. He was radio tracking hedgehogs there. One male hedgehog here over 12 nights uh, played an entire round of golf. Um, this is an 18 hole golf course, 30 hectares in size and it you know, manages to cover the entire area. And this is actually quite a good space for hedgehogs. <clears throat> in the northwest of the golf course, you've got um, gardens which are putting out supplementary food and the sort of woodland areas in the middle, um, you can see are really quite dense and, and uh, uh, good for losing golf balls, but also good for hiding as a hedgehog. When Nigel then began to look at the requirements of um, hedgehogs, he found that on the whole, his hedgehogs had a, the male hedgehogs had a home range of about 30 hectares, and female hedgehogs about 10 hectares. Male hedgehogs tended to walk about two kilometers a night and female hedgehogs at one kilometer a night. Now the hedgehogs have a home range. They don't have a territory they defend, just a home range that they, they share somewhat grumpily. And the more work we do to get them into our gardens, the more they come closer to each other and the grumpier they get. So this is, that was a good piece of work. Then we got um, Tom Morehouse, who's an academic at I just retired, University of Oxford. And he did a computer model looking at the minimum viable population requirements for hedgehogs. And this is a, a, a really interesting idea. If you imagine um, two absurd scenarios, uh, you have an island in the middle of the ocean and it's the best hedgehog habitat ever. And it's got one male hedgehog in the middle of the island. Um, that's not a viable population. And you've got another island, well, a desert island with no trees, no nothing. And you, you've got a, a thousand hedgehogs on it. Uh, that is not a viable population either because there isn't a habitat for them to be able to survive. And those are both absurd, obviously. But if you collect all of the data about the requirements hedgehogs have and put it into a computer model, you can run this through until you find the minimum requirements. And what Tom did was find that your island needs to be about 90 hectares for your starting population of 32 hedgehogs to have a chance of surviving over time. Now, obviously our islands are not absolute islands. Uh, they will be areas of suburbia, which are surrounded by a motorway or you know, busy ring roads or canals or, or fenced off uh, railway lines. Uh, so, so these are not perfect islands, but they are almost islands. You need to start conceiving of the landscape as these pockets of land. And so we need to now find you know, something the size of three 18 hole golf courses, which hasn't been chopped up into little pieces to enable hedgehogs to be able to thrive. And to give you just that indication, this is some work done by Jessica Schaus. Um, uh, she was at Nottingham Trent University, but the work here was done in Brighton. I think the party scene 
was better down there. And she'd put, I point out when I was doing this work with hedgehogs, I was radio tracking hedgehogs and it rained most nights. Um, and it was very soggy and I was living in a caravan and um, admittedly by the end of it, I got quite close to the hedgehogs mainly because I think I smelt like a hedgehog. Now students are putting GPS tags on the hedgehogs and going home. But watch this, watch the way the hedgehogs move. Um, and the red one in particular is very instructive. You can see uh, uh, the, the male and female hedgehogs there. Uh, you'll see how many gardens the hedgehogs actually use in a night. I also love the fact, if you look at the clock ticking through, we get to eight o'clock at night and the alarm clock goes and they all start moving. Brilliant, anyway. Um, but you start to see in this uh, uh, Brighton housing estate, how many, hedgehog, how many gardens the hedgehogs actually use? And you go back to the title of the talk, why did the hedgehog cross the road? Well, well, the hedgehog crossed the road because it had no choice but to cross the road because it needed to get to all of these different habitats. The hedgehogs love our gardens because they're little microcosms. They provide this mosaic of habitats throughout the, throughout the landscape where you've got some which have got just the right amount of food for a Tuesday and another one which has got just the right amount of water for a Wednesday and another one which has got just the right amount of shelter for a Thursday. And they will keep moving and keep finding all of these different things. So we need to make sure the hedgehogs have got an avenue through this landscape. It's why the Hedgehog Street campaign, which we launched about well, 10 and a half years ago now, um, is, is so important. It's right at, the, right at the heart of the work we do. And the idea is very simple, very straightforward. You can, unless you happen to be maybe a uh, Russian oligarch or, or Tory minister, uh, you probably don't have a 90 hectare garden. Um, but, most of us, if we're lucky enough to have a garden, we've got a space which we can manage and we can make perfect for hedgehogs. Top tips coming, but it's not big enough. And so you talk to your neighbors and you make a hole and the hole just needs to be 13 centimeters square at the bottom of the fence. Um, and you just get your neighbors to talk to their neighbors and spread hedgehog love down the hedgehog street. And you know, people are talking about having a street party sometime later this year for something or other. Um, I reckon just, Let's overtake it with a hedgehog street party. Much more fun. We have hedgehog bake off, lots of hedgehog shaped cakes because that's a good thing. And celebrate the goodness of community along your street by having a wonderful celebration of what you've managed to achieve. I thought I ought to have a look at Sheffield. Oh my goodness. Um, so the talk I gave last night um, just north of Banbury, um, uh, it was, I, I did exactly the same scale map for there. And there was like four hedgehogs seen in the entire map. And partly that was down to the fact that people weren't really recording the data. But this, this is absolutely exciting. So many more sightings of hedgehogs. Now, this is partially a result of there being lots of lovely people around Sheffield, um, because this does measure people as well. Uh, so it measures people who will actually do the work. But it's also, over time, it's beginning to also capture the hotspots of hedgehogs. And so I'm wondering, I mean, Joe, maybe we'll talk about this uh, later, whether the recording process is a part of the, the, um, the, the uh, Hedgehog Friendly Campus project as well, because that sort of stuff is really useful. You can uh, um, log your information at the Big Hedgehog Map. You just sign up to Hedgehog Street. Uh, I think it's over 100,000 people have done that now. And um, it's all free. Sign up to this. It's all down to postcodes, so nothing more personal than that. And, and upload your data. Really, really useful. And... Um, I've been involved with helping people make holes. Um, I have to say that of all the things I do in my life, uh, using power tools is one of my least favorite. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm just terrified of things like that. I don't quite understand how it works. And I, I've actually, I recognize I'd much rather have somebody capable doing a sort of thing while I take photographs. Um, but anyway, it, it, it works. Um, we always have a stunt hedgehog just to check it's the right size. That's a 127 millimeter core drill bit. Um, so, I mean, the ideal size is a CD case in the 13 centimeter square, but this is, is good enough. And there, people have taken up the challenge of making these holes. Uh, and one of the simplest ways is to get an angry hedgehog in a large catapult and go full Bugs Bunny with it. Um, uh, that's the Cherwell Boathouse in Oxford. But my favorite place I've been to so far is a, a, an Oxfordshire village called Kirtlington. And in Kirtlington, uh, I've had the pleasure of going there many times and I've lectured uh, and given talks there. And after, I think, my second visit, they, they uh, maybe they were fed up with me. Uh, but they said, look, we're going to do something. And so what the Kirtlington Wildlife and Conservation Society, the quacks, uh, did was get a um, big detailed map of the village and work out the minimum number of holes they needed to make to join up most of the village. 
And it was a really fascinating exercise. They'd find a pinch point because it was one house which meant that they could connect up two whole chunks of the village and, and then their people in the house moved and they were able to convince the new people that they could, and it was wonderful. And it was, they've, they've, it's in a lot of stone walls there and they've, they've gone sort of full Neolithic tomb in some of the styles. They've got the drills out, they've worked the churchyards, they've worked the pub and they have done amazing things. And so my friend, Chris, who's the sort of motivator behind all of this, um, I was asking him when he explained his plan. I said, well, what is he going to do about your garden? Because it's two and a half feet lower than his neighbors. And all the experiments of trampolines had failed. And he just said, oh, I'm going to build a staircase. And I said, what an elegant staircase, but does it work? Well, on the very first night the staircase was open for business, admittedly he had been baiting with food either side. A hedgehog came through the hole at the top, paused on the dais before sashaying down the staircase. Absolutely delightful. A couple of years later, he sent me this video which shows the staircase in action. It shows the hedgehogs can use it walking up and walking backwards as well. Um, it also reveals a slight design flaw, which um, you might notice. So it, you know, if you build it, you know, they will come. And this is a regularly used corridor that the hedgehogs use. But I, I went up um, beginning no, beginning of last year to photograph Chris um, for an article I was writing. And, and he said, you've got to come and see what I've done now. And it was, he, was, he was so excited. Um, one of his neighbors has got an even bigger height difference between the gardens and, um, and look what he built. I was like, this is just genius. Um, it's covered in sort of mortar. So it's all, um, it's a rough surface, uh, but yeah, does it work? Of course it does. So I'm deciding what I'd really like to do now is to collect loads of uh, video footage like this of the hedgehogs using staircases and using ramps and doing all sorts of things and then get and my wife's a video maker and I'm sure she could edit it together, basically turn it into a version of, of Sonic the Hedgehog with little gold rings all the way along the thing. I think we could probably make some money doing this or get sued like one or the other. Anyway, point is you can do this and it will work. It's hard work though. And actually, isn't it great now? Because the fencing suppliers are beginning to catch on. And this is really exciting. You can now buy these quite easily. When we started this, we were negotiating with a fence manufacturer and they were really slow and they didn't, they came up with an idea which is a bit stupid. And, but now people are catching on. The reason they're catching on is very simple because we've been piling on the pressure. So uh, three and a bit years ago now, Yes, three, about three and a half years ago, I was contacted by change.org, the online petition uh, um, website. And um, I'm hoping that, that Nikki might add my little link into the chat thing now so you can all click on it. Thanks, Nikki. Um, I, uh, so change, change.org slash save our hedgehogs. And uh, so change.org got in touch with me and they said, uh, we see the hedgehogs are good business, but, uh, um, are a good cause and they attract a lot of attention. Um, and, uh, and we would like you to launch a campaign um, to help bring hedgehogs back to their former glory. That was the phrase, they, get hedgehogs back to their former glory. Um, and I was going, well, I've been waiting over 30 years for this, you bet, okay. And they said, so all you need to do is formulate a question, or a, a demand rather, a demand. And you put that demand out there and you try and attract people to the petition and then you try and make the change happen. What do you want to do to see hedgehogs return to their former glory? I said, oh, simple, this is great. We need to dismantle industrial capitalism and replace it with something nicer. And, uh, and that's when they, they said no. Um, and so we, had, we went back and forth a little bit. And in the end, I was left with, a, left with a demand which seemed almost trivial. Um, the demand is that uh, all new housing developments, as Nikki was explaining, should come with hedgehog highways in place so that you don't have to go make your holes afterwards. Um, and I was just feeling a little despondent because I wanted something more dramatic. And they were just saying, look, it's better to get lots of people on site because you can create change in unexpected ways. And anyway, they said, every time you do an update for your petition, uh, everybody who signs it gets sent it. How many people read your blog, they said, which I thought was a bit unfair. So when I got to 100,000 signatures, I was suddenly feeling really quite powerful. 
you know, suddenly my, my, my little, and so, I mean, I've done about 150 of these, I think now, little stories about hedgehogs, top tips, the news, all these things. Um, 100,000 people got those. And then we got to 500,000 signatures. And I got a meeting with the housing minister who, who, who was really like an undercooked piece of liver. Anyway, um, but it, that didn't gain very much traction. But I, through him, I then got to meet one of the bosses of one of the biggest housing developers. That's okay, this is quite good. Then in July, 2019, um, if you cast your mind back to a time when you thought things probably weren't going to get any worse, and that priapic marshmallow moved into number 10, uh, and it's been great ever since. Um, and we had that moment that the various ministers were being, being shed their roles. And James Brokenshire, um, uh, who unfortunately died just before Christmas, he was the Secretary of State in, involved with the planning system. And he, his last thing he did, his last press release that he put out, or his team put out, uh, was a statement that they were changing the national planning policy framework which is one of the most boring documents ever, um, but also one of the most important documents ever because the NPPF goes out to all of the local authorities planning departments explaining what they can and can't ask for and what they can and can't allow. And in that, there was one paragraph which stated that there would be guidance that there should be hedgehog highways in all new developments and swift bricks applied in all new developments. And, and for me, knowing that the RSPB had spent maybe a decade, you know, the biggest conservation organization in the country, had spent a decade achieving that. And I'd spent, uh, by that stage, about nine months in my shed, shouting at the computer, doing that. I, I, was, I was quite chuffed. But the, the, the detail, there was detail. Guidance, this is just guidance, there's no teeth to it. So I thought, right, well, I will continue. We will wait till they've sorted Brexit out, and then we can get back to, oh, we'll wait till they've sorted COVID out, and then we'll get back. Okay, so we'll wait till we've sorted things out in Ukraine, and then eventually we'll be able to have a chat with, now it's Michael Gove. So if I can get him off the dance floor for long enough, I reckon we've got a chance. Um, but at the moment, we still have guidance. Now, that in itself is good, because it means that local authorities can put planning obligations onto developers. It can be part of the obligation that they need to put these in. Um, but uh, still, but it's not quite at the level of compulsion, which I would like it to be. We've had other benefits too. Um, Bovis Homes uh, are now working with us, the Hedgehog Society, um, committed to making all their new developments. Hedgehog friend, or have, have hedgehog highways in them. Where possible, there's a few ones on steep slopes, which they are struggling with. Um, I'm really, really, really not going to find myself seduced by greenwash. I was actually in a meeting with Bovis Homes. I said, look, I, I've sat in front of bulldozers before. I will sit in front of bulldozers again. Um, you know, I'm not having this used as nonsense. And actually, now we've got Linden Homes, which Bo was brought up as part of this gang, and Taylor Wimpy have joined up as well. They're doing it. And we're going soon to get to a point of critical mass with developers such that the next step of the plan comes into action. Because at the moment, the Hedgehog is not Schedule 5 on the Wildlife and Countryside Act, which means it doesn't have a particularly great deal of protection. Um, other species really do. You know, bats, dormice, things like that have a, have a, up there on, they're on Schedule 5. The Hedgehog is still Schedule 6. We've tried hard to get the hedgehog moved onto Schedule 5 and failed so far. Um, but it's all up in the air. The negotiations are still going on. It's a wonderfully called thing, a quinquennial review, which if I played active Scrabble with two Qs in it would be quite a good word. Uh, or oh, the quinquennial review. Sorry, the quinquennial, anyway, this is what they're going through at the moment. I don't think we're going to see the hedgehog given the extra status. But what that status would mean is that when a developer moved into an area and started to clear it, they would have to check for hedgehogs as well as all the other species. And they would have to move them and they would have to mitigate against damage to their habitats and make sure that there was some remedy put in place. At the moment, what they're doing is turning up, destroying things and putting in hedgehog highways and saying, hey, aren't we great? So that's not going to be allowed to continue for much longer. There needs to be this extra layer of work done. And if we can't get the change in legislation, we're going to get the developers to do it anyway, because otherwise they will be called out for greenwashing. So the petition has moved on a pace, and um, I have had a moment of absolute, absolute glory um, for not the million, the million signatures, ne never mind that. The moment of glory was the five minutes that my teenage daughter was impressed by me. 
And for those of you who've got children, you'll appreciate this. Um, and she was impressed with me because um, Tom Holland had tweeted that I was the Lorax of hedgehogs. You remember the lovely story, the Lorax, Dr. Zeus story. I was a Lorax of hedgehogs, which in itself was wonderful. But this was Tom Holland. And what my, my dear daughter did not appreciate for the first five minutes was that there is the Tom Holland who is Spider-Man and the amazing dancer and extremely good looking. Um, and there's also Tom Holland, who was the Radio 4 presenter on the history program and, and a leading author on, on history books. And so um, anyway, five minutes was good. And I appreciated it. Anyway, she went back to despising me, but that was great. We're over a million signatures strong and I am, I'm just keeping going. Um, relentless, polite prodding. And the results of this are really, really pleasing. Um, because a million signatures signing up to things, it's very difficult to communicate. I set up a Hedgehog Highways Facebook group. That's about 20,000 members now. Thank you to my two wonderful uh, uh, moderators who keep, uh, keep the lunatics largely out of play. Um, because I, I realize quite how nutty some people are. Oh my goodness. Thank you, moderators. I really appreciate you. But the, um, what's happened through this though, is the communication has become much faster, much more effective. And uh, uh, one of my favorite stories is a guy called Jonathan Housko from Suffolk. And he, in his village in Thurston, he had three developers building projects around his village. And, um, and so he got in touch and explained what's going on. We talked about it. So he then wrote to each developer. And the first one to get back to him was Linden Holmes, who'd recently been bought up by Bovis. And they said, we're doing it already. We're making Hedgehog Highways. Uh, then the second one was a small family firm and uh, they got back in touch, said, oh, we've looked at the plans. That seems totally reasonable. Yes, we'll do it. The third, Persimmon, wrote back and said, don't be stupid. Uh, they're not protected. We've got no obligation to do this. We're not going to do that. Um, and so he got back in touch with me. We went back for. So he wrote again, another polite letter and then another letter. And eventually, and this is the thing, polite persistence really can work. Eventually, Persimmon said, yeah, they'll do it too. Now, we then need, we'll have him eyes on the ground seeing what actually happens, but it's great to get them doing this. So Hedgehog Highways Facebook group, really good space for actually sharing uh, um, information, asking for questions um, and, and, uh, and, and avoiding lunatics, which is good. So um, I haven't looked at my, how long have I? Um yeah you've you've definitely had your 45 minutes Hugh. How I'm, are you sorry, I'm sorry okay uh, be nice put a ramp in your pond don't drop litter hedgehogs have got no fight or flight response i'm sorry i got distracted um so so they will be nobbled by strimmers and bonfires uh, uh the, the fight or flight response is really crucial uh, uh they don't have it um then you might get poo and if you're lucky you'll see a bit of sex um this does lead on to a whole other anecdote about uh, bonking hedgehogs, but we'll leave that uh, to, to, to the side for now. Needless to say, however, mating cannot take place while the female frowns. You can see she's frowning there, the prickles over the front of her face. Um, and, and this whole process leads to the creation of flattened arena of vegetation, um, uh, which, which has led to the greatest headline ever. Um, 1991 Seriological Conference. Um, I, I, I don't want to lose Joe. Hedgehogs, their ace. Basically, it was them what made the crop circles, uh, uh, not, not, not little hedgehogs. And what have hedgehogs ever done for this? I only put this in because of an incident at the WI talk where I nearly got really grumpy. That whole anthropocentric view of, of conservation, it really, really annoys me. Um, OK, so they're not going to be ecosystem engineers like beavers, and they may not be involved with the pollination effort of our solitary bees, but they're still the most important creature on the planet. Um, read my book, you'll find out why. Uh, sorry, I didn't realize quite how long I burbled for. Apologies to everybody. Uh, and um, and uh, yeah, happy to, you've seen my thing at Hedgehog Hugh, drop me a note. I can answer more questions there if we don't get through them all now. Thank um, you, sorry. Hugh. No, no need to apologize because everyone was really engrossed with what you're saying, fantastic stuff. But we do have quite a lot of questions coming in. So we want to save a bit of time for the questions. Um, but before we go to questions, I'm just going to introduce Joe Wilkinson. And I think this is really special because I phoned up Joe um, a few months ago and said we were planning this event and the second Hedgehog event. And what I'd spoken to Joe when she's setting up Hedgehog Friendly Campus, but what I hadn't realised until I spoke to her more recently is that she was directly inspired by your 2017 talk in Sheffield that we hosted. She was so inspired that she just said, right, I'm going to do hedgehogs now. 
for my job and set up Hedgehog Friendly Campus initially in Sheffield. And it's grown to a national project with 160 universities, colleges and primary school campus, which is absolutely incredible just in those few years. She's the program director and manager for Hedgehog Friendly Campus, which is a biodiversity award scheme for universities, colleges and primary schools. She's in the past worked at University of Sheffield and the council, and she's volunteered with uh, Suffolk and the Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife Trust on hedgehog projects, uh, because we were running hedgehog projects uh, at the time when we had Hugh. So I'm so excited that somebody was so inspired to just set up their own amazing hedgehog project. So Joe's going to tell us a little bit about that now. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Nikki, and thanks, Hugh. I can see Hugh's head growing really big in the screen there, knowing. <laughs> knowing his um his uh, influence but it's absolutely true and i think um you know hedgehog everybody loves hedgehogs um but you do sometimes need a way in don't you and for me it was absolutely that event um and it really did inspire me to you know kind of go down a, a slightly niche slightly niche pathway for a for a job role and i would uh, absolutely encourage anybody who's in the process of looking for a job or thinking about careers in the future and um, think about doing something that you're really you're really passionate about because it keeps it keeps the momentum going um absolutely and so hedgehog friendly campus is kind of was born of my love of hedgehogs and my um uh just keenness really to do something that i was really passionate about um so hedgehog friendly campus uh, is funded by the british hedgehog preservation society so just a quick shout out um to them they're an amazing charity that do loads of awareness um, um, and campaigning for uh, for hedgehogs in general. If you haven't heard of them, or if you're not a member and you're interested, um, just give them a quick Google. Um, and for our socials, it's at Hog Friendly, if you would like to learn a little bit more about what the programme is about. So back in 2017, I was really lucky um, to uh, not only hear Hugh Warwick speak at uh, the Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife Trust event, but also um, to gain a um, internship at the Suffolk Wildlife Trust. Um, and I was doing loads of really great stuff with their pro uh, project officer, hedgehog officer there, um, including sort of education with communities, but also doing a big kind of um, Ipswich wide hedgehog survey. This is me using a hedgehog survey tunnel to survey um, a local community um, to try and figure out whether there are hedgehogs there. And I just absolutely loved it. Um, and I knew there would, must have been something something in that for other people, because often I think when you're doing this kind of thing, it's assumed that you know you've got to have a scientific background to really understand what you're doing. Um, and I do. I come from science. I have a master's in environmental science. Um, but you know everybody cares about hedgehogs and everybody wants to know what to do. And I thought there must be something in this. People people want to learn this stuff. So maybe we there's something in simplifying it for people. So when I finally graduated and I got my first job, it was at the University of Sheffield, um, and I was given the opportunity to work on my own mini project towards the end of the role. Um, and I decided that I wanted to make it about hedgehogs. So we came up with this idea to um, get lots of people involved in surveying the campus and learning about what hedgehog footprints look like um, and also to make sort of hedgehog friendly changes to the university itself as well and it was a smash hit a total smash hit everybody loved it um, and it was just a really great chance for people to kind of uh, just link with nature in a or the environment in a slightly different way um, so it was uh, yeah such a smash hit in fact that the british hedgehog preservation society offered funding to develop the campaign as a, as a national campaign and as Nikki said we're now um, in working in and with lots and lots of universities colleges and schools across the whole of the UK so that's where it started humble beginnings um, so Hedgehog Friendly Campus is a free national award program so this is where it's moved to it's an award scheme now funded entirely by the Hedgehog Society and our universities, colleges and schools have the chance to go for various different levels of accreditation. And the accreditation is certified by the British Hedgehog Preservation Society. So all the stuff that they're doing is um, certified good stuff for hedgehogs. Um, we work with anyone um, that will have us really, so staff or students from within educational institutions. Sometimes it's grounds teams, sometimes it's student societies, sometimes it's eco councils. Um, primary school eco councils, 
really anybody um, that, that wants to learn more and wants to help. Green space, having green space on your campus or on your grounds is absolutely not a requirement to take part. We've got really inner city campuses taking part and raising awareness, um, but we've also got, you know, really rural or very green campuses. It's not a requirement and there's loads of stuff that every campus can do, whether you're urban or rural. And having hedgehogs on campus already is also not a requirement. Um, we've had that question previously. Um, it's kind of the point, really. Um, so hedgehogs, we know, are doing really badly, as Hugh, Hugh alluded to earlier or explained earlier on. Um, it, and in fact, actually, it's, it's you know, quite a surprise when we're working with a campus that does have hedgehogs already. The, the point is that we're working with those campuses to um, protect hedgehogs from hazards, of course, educate the community, but also to enhance the habitat so that hedgehogs have a place to live safely. Um, so we'll work with anyone that will have us really, um, and everybody seems to really enjoy it. The reason why it, we're focusing on hedgehogs is, of course, because hedgehogs are suffering really major, severe declines. They're vulnerable to extinction in Britain, um, and everybody loves a hedgehog. We know from asking that students really want to help they really want to help hedgehogs, they really want to help biodiversity, they really want to help nature, but often they just don't know how, what are those, what are the steps to do that? And that's really what a hedgehog friendly campus provides for those students is um, a sort of step by step toolkit almost um, for their particular campus so that they can make an impact during their time in education. Um, hedgehogs are also, you know, they're quite important as a, a sort of an indicator species. It's um, what we know about hedgehogs is because they rely on invertebrates for food and um, when they start to decline really rapidly or, or they suddenly become you know locally extinct from an area that's um, really a, a sign of a kind of um, depleted uh, nature so they're really emblematic of the current biodiversity crisis a part of the climate emergency that really doesn't get enough press and hedgehogs are almost used as a you know, sort of emblem for that. They're a way in for a lot of people to think about nature more broadly and how they can connect with wild nature. Um, so the programme itself, there's all sorts of different things involved in it. Um, it's, uh, it it's quite a thorough programme, um, but just to summarise it for you, um, the actions or activities that our campuses or grounds are doing range from protecting hedgehogs from various hazards so things like ponds and strimmers and poisons um, but also enhancing the, the habitat that exists there so creating new hedgehog friendly habitats to replace the ones that have been lost across the uk there's a big focus um, on education as well so raising awareness with staff students and those in the local community about how they can help so that's really um kind of summarizes the theme of the program and some examples over there on the right hand side of some of the activities our um, campuses have been getting involved in. Um, uh, the programme offers a lot of support to the teams or the campuses that get involved, um, which ranges from workshops and talks through to quite dedicated training for, for grounds teams and also awareness raising resources of so flyers and leaflets. What we do that's really popular um, is we also provide resources and training for um, hedgehog surveys. So uh, Hugh had asked, you know, do we do we filter into the big hedgehog map? Are we are we in the process of trying to get any data um, on whether or not hedgehogs are uh, visiting campuses? Yes, we are. Um, and so thanks to the funding from the Hedgehog Society, we're able to provide footprint tunnels and cameras to campuses who want to know a little bit more about whether hedgehogs are there. And just last week um, or the week before, the University of Greenwich who were one of our, of our hedgehog friendly campuses um, it was very exciting they found the or they became aware of their first hedgehog sighting since i believe it was 2001 their first recorded hedgehog sighting um for a very very long time um in thanks to this program which is great so um just a quick video to show you how we go about tracking hedgehogs on our campuses so we use a combination of wildlife cameras but also footprint tunnels which are the one the ones that you can see in the video but also the one that you saw me playing with in that initial slide they're really simple you can do them in your own garden it's just a, a any you can build them out of plastic or cardboard um, they just need to be tunnel shaped quite long they have a little bit of food inside you can see that hedgehogs eating some food out of a dish in the center there it's drawn the animal in over a sort of inky pad 
it's completely wildlife safe ink and then as they exit the tunnel they leave footprints behind and then it's just up to the wildlife detectives on our campuses of which we've got many many hundreds of to um really figure out you know what's a hedgehog print um with support from us so this is the most popular activity that we do um i'm sure you can see why um so just a, a, just a couple of case studies really from um some of our hedgehog friendly campuses um and i just picked uh, i sort of randomly picked because they're all so great um they're all doing really different stuff uh, because you know, some are very urban some are very rural um some don't have a lot of green space and some do lord derrimore's primary school um they joined the program just last year um and they worked really really hard um throughout the entire year uh, in that their entire school really to make hedgehog friendly changes to the grounds um, they did all sorts of stuff. This is just a selection of some of the um, really fantastic um, things that they did. So if you can see on the left hand side in this image here, uh, apologies, it's quite small. The ground is quite vast at Derry Moors. They're very blessed to have um, quite a large, uh, very sort of green grounds. Um, and they wanted to make sure that hedgehogs could get access into that ground. So you can see um, a number of year six pupils there holding on to hedgehog highway signs. So they've obviously been listening to what Hugh has to say. They've basically created huge networks of hedgehog highways with access in and through the primary school, um, which actually featured in a newspaper. They, it was big press for them, um, a really, really fantastic initiative as part of the campaign. As well as that, they've been doing loads and loads of litter picking, which is something perhaps that gets forgotten in terms of campaigning sometimes. Litter is a big problem for hedgehogs as it is for all wildlife really. Um, so the pupils at Derrimores were doing all sorts of litter picking events, collecting litter from the, uh, the school grounds itself, but also in the local community. Um, so th they were really proud of that and they should be, they collected an awful lot of litter. You can see here um, in the sort of top right, this image here, this is um, some of the, the year three pupils, I think it is, um, doing a hedgehog footprint survey. So you can see the tunnels in use there. And just down at the bottom, um, two of the year six pupils, very proud to have found hedgehog footprints. Um, so a really wonderful example there. In fact, Derry Moore's achieved their gold award just uh, last month. Um, so they've reached gold already, which is really, really fantastic. Um, an example from a college. So we've got FE colleges engaging in the programme now, which is really great, just as of last year. And Sheeling Special Educational Needs College is a great example of that. Um, so they just achieved bronze last month so they're they're at their bronze award they're in the early stages with us and um, but even so they've been doing all sorts of really fantastic stuff and some of this perhaps you can learn from for your own gardens if you're interested um so from creating and deploying bug hotels now bug bugs are essentially the prime food for hedgehogs so the more you can do to encourage that natural feeding is, is fantastic but also allowing them somewhere to to nest and to and to sleep and to hide so you can see here they've been building hedgehog houses and popping them out on campus which is really lovely here we can see a member of the grounds team really proudly displaying um, a strimmer so a grass strimmer grass strimmers can be quite a hazard for hedgehogs and um, because of that lack of fight or flight response um, it, it's quite common for hedgehogs to be um, unfortunately injured or killed by strimmers so the british hedgehog preservation society gives free warning stickers out to anybody that will have them just so that users are reminded to check the area before they before they strim or mow and at shielding that's absolutely the case and all of the staff are aware of that which is really really important um, and they've done an awful lot uh, to raise awareness and education um, in uh, the local community but also with their students as well and this is just one example um, is just one side of a four sided information board that is dedicated to hedgehogs in the grounds so that students can learn a little bit more about what a hedgehog is and what a hedgehog needs and what a hedgehog does. So Sheeling are fab um, and uh, congrats to them on get, getting their bronze award. From a university's perspective, which is where the campaign began, obviously, um, Derby is a fantastic example here. Uh, I could have told you all about Sheffield, um, but no doubt you already know a lot of what they've been doing. Derby um, are a really great student led team. Um, so they are a team of perhaps uh, 15 or 20 students that are all really, really um, dedicated to the campaign. They've been doing all sorts um, from installing habitat piles and log piles. Um, putting in pond ramps on the ponds on campus and planting wildflowers. So this is a um, this was them, I think last year, actually uh, planting a, a wildflower meadow on their hedgehog friendly zones, as well as loads and loads of hedgehog surveying as well. So there's 
all sorts of stuff going on um, across all of the campuses that are involved in the program and we're really 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 proud of all of them derby just achieved silver award this year as well so well done to them um so it's over to you really to, to have a little think about whether there are any campuses so be that a university a college or a primary school that you think might be interested in taking part in this program because we think there must be loads of them that perhaps just don't know about it yet and um, in particular we're recruiting new primary schools to take part this year and we've just reopened the doors for registration um, and we would love for anybody interested to get in touch um, so info at hedgehogfriendlycampus.co.uk um, or at hogfriendly on social media um, and we can direct you to the right channels to get um, to get registered um, so thanks ever so much uh, for listening and a big um, thank you to, to Nikki and the team for inviting us along today as well that's fantastic Joe. Um what a great achievement in such a short space of time and inspiring so many young people to do something really you know positive for nature um as i mentioned at the beginning um we're, we're working with other organizations in rotherham sheffield um on nature recovery sheffield and nature recovery rotherham and that's all about providing the tools the toolkits or other ways or inspiration for people to take action for nature if you haven't signed up if you live in Sheffield or Rotherham and you haven't already signed up for Nature Cover Sheffield to find out more about what you can do for nature Ian's going to put the links for those in the chat now do sign up if you're local no not all of you are and that's fine you can still take action where you live and <laughs> people calling in from all over the place um this is not um, exclusive by any means. Uh, Hedgehog Street is obviously national. Hedgehog Friendly Campus is national. And we've just got, we've got loads of questions come in. So I want to turn to the questions now. Um, so we have, a, I'm just going to go questions uh, to Joe first because uh, it's fresh in your mind. Um, you've said how people can get involved. How do people find out if their school is already involved? Um, so we do have a list on the website, um, which I can pop the link to in the in the chat box. Great, that'd be fab. And a question about what is the ink for in the hedgehog tunnels? Oh, the, the ink is um, so it's a mixture of charcoal powder and vegetable oil, really basic um, mixture. And it is just to collect the footprints. So otherwise, if a hedgehog were to go into the tunnel, you wouldn't know it was had been there. So the ink collects on the bottom of their their paws. And as they as they leave, they leave the little black paw prints behind. Excellent. And um, uh, Ian just put the link to the second event at Dern Valley College, who are desperate to be a hedgehog friendly campus, as some people on the call here tonight. They've been already just doing stuff for hedgehogs and they've made a hedgehog festival. I love this. Not just an event, a festival on the 2nd of um, April. And Joe's going to be there with some of her representatives. And we've got local groups talking about what they've been doing and parish councils. And it will be things like how to make a hedgehog tunnel, things like that, some practical hands on. So um, if you want to sign up for that, again, if you're local, um, either just put the chat, uh, the link for that um, in the chat. Now, some questions for Hugh. Um, this is a really good question. I like this. So this is going back to the why are hedgehogs declining? How much of the decline is to do with loss of earthworms due to soil degradation? I think that's a really good question. But we can't actually quantify which component has had the specific impact. Um, but the decline in earthworms due to com uh, compaction is, is a definite part there. But also the I mean, use of glyphosate has an impact on the earthworm populations. Um, and the use of so many other chemicals altogether will have an impact over time. And so, so the earthworms are just one of the many macroinvertebrates which are having their populations decline. Uh, and, but you're right, it is just a continual compaction of the soil uh, by the heavier and heavier machinery, which does have an impact as well. So yeah, it's hard to unpick which is which. Um, everything for, from flame retardants to, to um, uh, rodenticides uh, uh, to climate change, they're all conspiring to create an environment which is, which is less hospitable towards hedgehogs and other wildlife. And a follow on question about these pesticides, then somebody's asked about the government's announced um, last few days that a ban on the, the neonicotinoids was temporarily lifted, which is something the camp, the Wildlife Trust has been campaigning against. And we've put some links in the chat. So how do we, you know, what do we do about that? I mean, from Wildlife Trust point of view, we, we just keep campaigning, encouraging people to write to their MPs. But Hugh, do you have anything to say on that point about 
Well, I mean, the, the, the reason that is that the reason that they they have said well is is because of emergencies basically, uh, and the emergencies are to do with the climate changing and are to do with extreme weather events, um, and so it's it's not like uh, these emergencies are going to go away. Uh, yeah, these things are going to recur and they're going to become more and more uh, uh, persistent. And so there'll be more and more excuses for having to you know, turn back on these, these insecticidal chemicals, which have a much, much greater impact than just on any targets they might have. Um, I mean, for, for me, I would always look to, I mean, the Wilder Trust are doing great work, uh, Bug Life are doing great work. And, and you know, for the science as well, you, you, you turn to yeah, Dave Goulson and just see what he's doing. Um, if, if Dave Goulson is angry and upset, then there's really good reason to be angry and upset. Totally agree. We've had Dave Goulson speak a couple of times. Oh, okay. and he's absolutely brilliant um, and very credible indeed. Uh, so I agree with you in that. Um, we have some questions about, um, well, I think there were just points about the badgers and hedgehogs issue that you raised. Um, you know, somebody found hedgehog skin in severe, skins in severe drought, and they presumed badgers. Would, would that likely be a badger? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the sign of a badger predation event is just a hollowed out shell of a hedgehog. I mean, that's not always the case, because if there's been a hedgehog died of natural causes, uh, various scavengers and predators might well have hollowed it out. But, but that's what a badger will tend to leave. Um, but again, you know, absolutely the, the central message of this is this is not a sort of badger blaming exercise. Um, it's very much a case of we've got a whole bunch of wonderful nature out there, which if we don't mess up the wider environment, they can all get along just fine. Thank you very much. Uh, we just need to maybe undo some of the damage. Exactly. And that, that was a point somebody else made in the chat. There's not um, good versus bad wild creatures, <laughs> which he's got into arguments about with other uh, allotment holders. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yes, I agree. There's a couple that. of questions about um, hedgehogs in people's gardens. Um, somebody's saying that s some of them behave quite differently. Some sort of runs, one of them runs away and others just sit there and eat. Um, oh, but it just, this is absolutely prime material for it because it's, um, I've, you know, radio tracked hedgehogs and you get to know them quite well especially when you're living alone in a caravan at the top of a field um and uh, and it's you, so you're out every night and you begin to you get to the point where you can identify the hedgehogs without the call signature from their radio tracking device or any other marks on them because you see how they behave and so i found um in devon for example some of the hedgehogs would would um uh no longer curl up in a ball when i turned up they would know it was me if i was with somebody else they would curl up in a ball so yeah i, I was as i beginning to smell quite distinctive by that time i imagine um other hedgehogs had lost their sense of fear of me and again, if I was with somebody else, they would stop and roll up. But if it was just me walking into the place where they were, they would just run into the hedge. And it's like, well, that's no good. I chose hedgehogs to study, so I wouldn't have to do with this sort of thing. Um, but so they just charge away because they, again, had lost their sense of fear. And then there was one hedgehog called Nigel. Uh, I, you had to name your hedgehogs, obviously. Um, and Nigel just carried on behaving like a normal hedgehog. Um, and he just snuffled away and he carried on eating and, and it, it meant I got really close to him, be able to watch very close to what they're doing. So I entirely agree. Hedgehogs have got fantastic amounts of character. And this is that little extra step about the hedgehog, about why the hedgehog is so important is because you can get close to a whole bunch of wildlife, which is small and, you know, like worms and snails, whatever. They've not got much character, but hedgehogs have got character, a really sentient being, and you can get close to them because of their lack of fight or flight response. That's, that's so interesting. And the, a follow on question from that, the person wondered whether um, when hedgehogs have a high tick load, does that deplete their activity or change their behavior or health? Oh, interestingly, it tends to be the other way around. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's also tied in with the, the, the mythology about um, hedgehogs being covered in fleas. Uh, I mean, I've handled hundreds of hedgehogs and I've hardly ever seen a hedgehog flea, which is a shame because Archaeopsilla erinaceae is a species specific flea. It's a really special little thing. Um, on the whole, uh, hedgehogs get more parasites internally and externally when they're poorly. So if they're already uh, malnourished, if they've already got some other additional problems, they're more likely to present with uh, um, a, an infestation of, of, um, of ticks or fleas. And, and so the uh, reason why the flea story is so prevalent is because the hedgehog most people were ever likely to see was out in daytime, simply because you're more likely to see the hedgehog in daytime even though there are nocturnal species. Um, and the ones you see out in daytime on the whole are ill. And so the hedgehog you're most likely to see 
was already poorly and therefore more likely to have fleas and ticks. So yes, um, it, yeah, the, the ticks will deplete the reserves of the hedgehog, but actually they're more of a message to us saying, actually, something's not right here. That's really interesting. And I think um, so somebody's put a question in the chat, but I think somebody else has sort of answered it about if you've already got badgers, should you encourage hedgehogs? And then somebody else has said, I've got badgers and hedgehogs coexisting in my garden. I've got peanuts on the badgers on one side of the garden and hedgehog food on the other side. <laughs> so perhaps that's, perhaps that's the answer. But have you got anything to say on um, well, I mean, it, it's, a few questions about feeding hedgehogs as well? Okay, so it, it's different. I mean, it, you, if you make your garden accessible for wildlife, it's accessible for wildlife. And that's what I would look for doing. If I was to be, you know, if I had a, a walled garden and I wanted to put holes in the walls, I would put hedgehog sized holes in the walls rather than badger sized holes in the walls um, to encourage hedgehogs. But if you've already got badgers coming into the garden, hedgehogs will either avoid the garden um, or they will come in and take their chances. Um, and, and often, and it's the interesting thing about the increased activity with people feeding hedgehogs. Um, as the hedgehogs are particularly they're a solitary creature uh however so many videos if you go to the facebook group there's vast numbers of videos get put in of argy bargy of hedgehogs having a grumble and a fight and pushing each other around the place and this seems to happen an awful lot more um uh, than we would have thought i think it's because our gardens attract hedgehogs uh, because we're putting food out um in terms of the food for hedgehogs um they're carnivores um, the the uh, the old mythology of, of bread and milk. Well, I mean, it, it's it is based actually around the idea that hedgehogs stole milk from recumbent cows in the morning. Which, if you've actually looked at the size of a cow's teeth and you've looked at the sharpness of the hedgehog's teeth, you realise that's not going to benefit anybody and it's not going to happen. Um, hedgehogs are lactose intolerant. It's just uh, they don't know they're lactose intolerant, so so it can make them ill drinking milk. Uh, they're carnivorous, um, so ideally meat and water is what they need. And uh, putting out uh, as a wet pet food is quite a messy affair, can attract flies, can attract lots more interest from um, animals like rats. If you, the, the, the food of choice um, amongst the many, many thousands of people on the Facebook group seems to be at the moment Tesco's kitten kibble, uh, very high meat concentration and the roughness of it actually gives, uh, helps clean the hedgehog's teeth because if they just eat soft food, it's not good for them. And the trick to doing this is to actually create a feeding station rather than leaving a, a saucer of food out uh, because that food could be eaten by anybody. Um, and yeah, birds in the morning, foxes, cats, rats, anybody. So if you create a feeding station, an upturned box, 13 centimeter hole in, in the side. Um, and the best way to do it is if you put a partition into the box and you have the food right on the front wall of the box beside the hole, but with a wall in between, it means the hedgehog has to go in and come round to get to the food, but it means a cat can't get its paw in to pull the food out. Um, you put a brick on top to stop it being knocked over. And then you've also created a dead end space, which means that whilst you won't stop rats going in there, it does reduce the amount of time they'll stay there because they're caught in a corner. That's perfect. And you've pretty much read out the answer that someone else. Oh, um, sorry, I didn't see no, that. No, it's perfect. You're both saying the same thing. So that that's um, you, you must have heard your advice uh, previously. And, and water has also been highlighted as being popular. We, we rescued a hedgehog last summer that was very young and very small and very dehydrated. And after, you know, water, it, it perked up immediately. So yeah, when, it, when it's hot. Um, a couple of questions about uh, records uh, of somebody saying they will enter their records of where they've um, got rescue hedgehogs from. They look after rescue hedgehogs. Do, do you pick up iNaturalist records in the um, Hedgehog Street? Do, do they go onto Hedgehog Street? I think they, the they don't go that way around, but um, the iNaturalist and the Hedgehog yeah. Society things all go into the National Biological Record. They, the, um, MBN, whatever it is. So, um, so it, they go up, as it were. We're, we're one of the portals. It's not all the data on on the hedgehog, uh, the big hedgehog map. Um, yeah. And it is, it is, a, you know, that map is quite crude in the sense that it is, as I say, measuring nice people um, as much as it is measuring hedgehogs. Great. So they all connect. Yeah, definitely connected up. There's a question here um, about uh, somebody from the northeast of England saying it's colder. There on summer nights, um, just asking how they survive there. You know, obviously, in, in even even in the summer months, they do see them on the thermal image cameras. Um, any particular advice in the colder areas? Obviously, they're all you know they they they, they do live in pretty cold parts of, of Britain, don't they? Well, I mean, I remember, Erinaceus europaeus, our hedgehog, is found in Norway. Yeah, 
Um, so I mean, they, they they can cope. They can cope really well. Uh, yeah, they they they're found in they're found in Spain. They're found in Norway. They're found in Ireland. So they can cope the cold, the dry, the hot, the wet. Um, they are remarkably resilient generalist species, which is why we need to take their population decline so seriously. I mean, if this was a terribly precious little species, which if anything is changed, just drops dead, then then you would understand. It's like you, I mean, I'm, that's obviously being facetious, but if you remove coppice woodlands, you won't have your dormice. Um, and uh, so, but with the hedgehog, which is such a general species, which can cope with many different environments and eats a wide range of food and can shelter underneath decking uh, um, inside people's garages or, or in tusky grass or wherever, and they're suffering, then that's a real call to action because it's, it's telling us so much more than just the fact that the hedgehogs are suffering. It is giving an, a real alarm call for a wider ecological emergency. Um, and just a final question. Um, this may be one for you, or I might be able to answer it otherwise. Um, it's about the planning guidance uh, to developers. Um, the question was, was it for every council? You were talking about national guidance there, weren't you, Hugh? And I think how it's implemented does come down to the council, to some, each council. But, to yeah, some extent. Because, it's, because it's guidance, it's very much up to the local planning authorities yeah. to how they act. So it's one of those things which, so I'm often asked, I don't have a garden, what can I do? I live in flats, how can I help? So well, if you've got the time and energy, then please, you write to your representatives, you start to put pressure on them to do these things. You get in touch with your, the ecologists in your planning department, if there is an ecologist, or you get in touch with the planning uh, officers and you say, you know, is there any reason why not to do this? Um, and and you know, there, are, there is very little reason not to do it. Um, it it's a very simple, small thing. And, and as I say, it's, it's a stepping stone because once we get enough people doing it, it then becomes utterly absurd to go in and treat the hedgehog as a dispensable species when you're clearing the ground, uh, but then to become all, oh, aren't we wonderful uh, when you put in a few hedgehog tunnels. So yeah. this, this, it really is, this isn't the end game at all. This is very much the start of a journey. Whereas I want to see, yeah, we're not going to get the change to uh, the Wildlife and Countryside Act I'd like to see, but we may get the action which that change would bring brought about because developers don't want to seem uh, like a bunch of greenwashing tow rags. <laughs> and um, just to say, um, as Wildlife Trust, we're always lobbying uh, on both individual planning cases and at policy level nationally for improved policy and for, you know, um, individual developments put in hedgehog hedgehog tunnels as well, hedgehog highways, and we've had some success with that uh, locally. Um, we we do need we have run out of time. There've been some fantastic questions. Somebody's asking about making or buying hedgehog houses, but we've put a link to to how to make make one online. Or yes, you can you can buy them. That's fine. Um, the final question about injured hedgehogs. There are local rescue centres. Uh, all around the country. Um, if you want to, if you're in our area, you want to find out where, if you email us at takeaction um, at wildsheffield.com, we'll put you in touch with your local rescue centre. Um, and we'd be really interested to know if you've been inspired tonight to take some action for hedgehogs. Again, you can email us and let us know at uh, takeaction at wildsheffield.com. And this will be um, on YouTube. Some people have asked about, will we send in a follow up email with this, the links and the YouTube because of a lot of information and not everybody's had the chat on the screen if they're watching on the TV or anything. So we'll make sure that you get all the information and um, about signing up for the second in-person event if you can if you can make that. So uh, just say- uh, Can I just ask something about yeah. the second in-person event? Yeah. Um, is there going to be a hedgehog bake-off? <laughs> Uh, well, I don't know. I did. Well, I did, I did <laughs> Do you want to be Whitney. a judge? <laughs> and I did one in Whitney, and it was so much fun. Um, and we had we had about twenty different people bring in their their hedgehog shaped cakes, and then they all got auctioned off to raise money for you know the good causes as well. Uh, but it was just an added bit to it, and it was it was really really good fun. And we had one for the tenth anniversary of the Hedgehog Street campaign, and there was some Bake Off prize winner who, who was the judge who got it wrong because there was a better cake uh but that, that was all done aesthetically because it was all done during covid times on zoom uh but it was um so i just in terms of a thing to do i really no reckon idea. i mean I've, I've i was brought up going to uh do talks at the women's institute so i'm a big fan of cake fantastic <laughs> um and we've just had loads of positive feedback in the chat too many too many to read out uh, people saying how, how much they enjoyed tonight oh and it is world book day 
So go oh, onto the news website, order his books, they are there. And um, just remains me to thank the audience for coming tonight and to thank Joe and thank you. And we'll see you all again next time. And thanks thank so much for organizing. Thank you. Bye bye, thank you everybody. So much. Bye.